Hey everybody, uh, this is probably our last or maybe second to last video here where we're going to introduce some new content and it might be a little bit on the long side but what we're going to do here in this video is we're going to really tie together some of the ideas that we've been working towards. We've been developing the concept of free energy, we're going to kind of wrap that up. We're going to very overtly tie it into the idea of equilibrium and then see how the ideas of equilibrium are tied to the ideas of spontaneity all through free energy. We're also going to develop a, uh, an equation that will allow us to connect equilibrium constants at different temperatures by way of some uh, thermodynamic parameters. It's going to be called an equation called the Van't Hoff equation. All right, so I'm going to get rid of my face here. We're going to go ahead and move on and look at a specific situation here, or maybe not a specific situation, a, a general situation of <clears throat> the simple equilibrium of A going to form uh, B. Now, when we have A going to form B, let's put this together. What does this actually mean if we were to, to graph it? All right, if we were to do a free energy diagram, so we have free energy on the y-axis here and time on the x-axis. If A and B are in equilibrium with one another, what does that mean with respect to their relative free energies? So, for example, if A has this amount of free energy, let's call that A right there, and A and B are in equilibrium with each other, where am I going to put B? Am I going to put B below the level of A? Am I going to put it above the level of A? Or am I going to put it right at the level of A? Well, if they're in equilibrium, then we're going to want to try to put it right at the level of A. So A and B have the same free energy. So in the reaction course, in going from A to B, right, we've got that hill, and we're going to talk about the hill in the next unit in kinetics, but A and B have the same free energy, right? So their delta G here, the change in G going from A to B here, is going to be zero. That's what it means for two things to be um, in equilibrium with one another. So you remember the equation we uh, developed earlier where we have delta G, uh, I want to get rid of that little dot there, <clears throat> where delta G is equal to delta G zero plus R T L N Q. Now, if we're at equilibrium, a couple of things about this equation are going to change. At equilibrium, delta G goes to zero, and the reaction quotient Q goes to K. So we have zero and K for those two terms there. So then I can rearrange that equation to give me delta G zero is going to be equal to negative R T L N K. This is a pretty important equation, so we're going to go ahead and box this guy, star it, and even put a little smiley face on it. So we have here an important connection. I can connect the standard free energy change, delta G0, to the equilibrium constant of a reaction at a particular temperature, and of course R is the gas constant, 8.314 joules per Kelvin. So here is kind of the overt connection between free energy and equilibrium. We're going to come back to this idea um, uh, a little bit later in this video, uh, but let's take a specific example here. So I want you to be able to calculate the delta G0 and the K for this reaction involving nitrogen dioxide to dinitrogen tetraoxide, and I'm giving you the free energy values there. So hopefully you can uh, whip out the answer to this pretty, uh, pretty quickly. Uh, we've got the free energies of formation, so all I have to do is a products minus reactants calculation. So that's going to be 97.82 minus 2 times 51.30. And when we do that, we get the answer of negative 4.78 kilojoules. Okay, so what does that tell us about the reaction? Well, it tells us if I have a negative free energy change that given the standard state conditions that we have here, delta G0, if I have a negative free energy change, then this tells me that this reaction is going to be spontaneous, right? The uh, negative delta G value tells me that this reaction is spontaneous. Well, let's see what else that might mean. Let's put this in context of the equation we just derived on the previous slide. So in other words, let's calculate the, um, the equilibrium constant for this reaction. 
So I can rearrange the previous equation on the previous slide to get me the natural log of the equilibrium constant is equal to negative delta G zero over RT. And if I plug in my values here, R is going to be 8.314 joules per Kelvin mole. T will, of course, be the temperature up here, 25 degrees, but I need to convert that to Kelvin. And then I just have to make sure that when I put my delta G zero in here, that the delta G zero and the R match up in terms of their units. So I'm going to turn this kilojoules into joules. So I'll turn it into uh, negative 4,780 joules. And then remember that minus sign and that minus sign are going to come kind of combine together to sort of cancel each other out. So eventually, if you plug in the variables and you uh, exponentiate both sides because we need to get rid of the natural log here, we will find that the equilibrium constant, whoops, didn't mean to do that, that the equilibrium constant for this reaction K is equal to, I just calculated it out, I got 6.88. Now, let's see if we can get the connection between our two values here. We've just seen that the reaction is spontaneous because it has a negative delta G. The value of K also tells us that it's spontaneous, and it's going to give us a kind of a new definition of spontaneous. This value of K, the equilibrium constant, is greater than 1. Do you remember what it means if an equilibrium constant is greater than 1 in terms of which side of the chemical equilibrium it favors? Right? K's greater than 1 are going to favor the product side of the reaction, so in this case, the N2O4. So because my K is bigger than 1, this equilibrium leans to the right. It favors products. Well, favors products sounds an awful lot like what we mean when we talk about spontaneity. A reaction that is spontaneous will proceed forward at, in the direction it's written. It will go left to right. That's what spontaneous means. Well, that jives with the value of K. The K is bigger than 1. It favors products. So a spontaneous reaction, if you want to put it in more rigorous thermodynamic terms, is a reaction that favors products. So we can see the connections here. Now another thing you might want to play around with is just manipulate the equation that we have here up here. Okay? Instead of doing the calculation the way I've written it, imagine the reaction is reversed. So switch reactants and products. What value of delta G zero would you then get? Turns out you're going to get positive 0.478 if you um, flip reactants for products. And then you'll see that you're going to get a K value that's smaller than 1. So if you get a positive G and a smaller than 1K, again, they're both saying the same thing. The reaction would be non-spontaneous and that the reaction favors, in, this, in that case, reactants. All right, so what an equilibrium favors, reactants or products, and whether a reaction is uh, non-spontaneous or spontaneous, all connect together. They're the same idea, they're the same essential concepts. All right, so that's playing around with that important relation K and G0. Now I just want to sketch out um, a couple of sort of extreme cases here. Let's look at the three cases for when A is in equilibrium with B. If A is in equilibrium with B, then we know that the overall G change, delta G, has got to be equal to zero. That's got to be true. But then the question becomes, if we were to chart, let's say we were to tar chart G zero versus time, what would these different um, conditions look like? A K equal to one, if I were to chart G zero versus time for K greater than one, and G zero versus time for K less than one. Well, let's look at K greater than one, the condition in the middle. If uh, K is greater than 1, then that tells us that the reactants are, excuse me, that the products are going to be favored. So that tells us that the reaction is spontaneous and that the delta G0 is going to have a negative value. So A would start here, B would end up there, and so you'd end up lower than where you started. That's an equilibrium that favors products. It's a spontaneous reaction. K less than 1, A would start here then B would be higher in free energy, and it would be sort of going uphill. So we've got a reaction there that favors reactants.
that's non-spontaneous. Then in the very, very specific case of k being equal to 1, a would be there, b would be there, and we would have a delta g equal to 0, and our delta g 0 would also be equal to 0. So this is just sort of a, a pictorial representation of what it might mean for, um, in the middle case, a spontaneous reaction, on the right, a non-spontaneous reaction, and on the left, a, a, a reaction that is at, a, at equilibrium, but it's even a, a, an even more unique equilibrium where the k is equal to 1. This far left situation never happens. It's a theoretical idea. Your k values for any reaction, your equilibrium constants, are always some number bigger than 1 or some number less than 1. So the far left is really kind of a theoretical construct. All right, I want to do one more thing. I'm going to bring up a, a blank piece of paper to do this. We're now going to tie together a couple of ideas. You remember our most important equation ever, delta G0 equals delta H0 minus T delta S0. And earlier in this video, we derived a, another connection, another equation for delta G0, namely delta G0 equals minus R T L N K. Let me get that minus sign in there so we make sure we see it. So I'm going to do a little bit of algebra here. Hopefully you see where I'm going. I've got two equations that are equal to delta G0. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to combine these two equations and I'm going to do a little bit of rearranging. Now I'm going to kind of skip some of the intermediate algebra steps, but if I take both of these equations and I set delta H minus T delta S equal to negative RT ln K, and I do a little bit more rearranging. The equation I'm going to get is that the natural log of K is going to be equal to the delta S zero over R minus uh, delta H zero over RT. Right Now, this might look like it's uh, not something you already know, but believe it or not, this actually is something you already know. This has the general shape of y equals mx plus b, and I'll explain how that is in a second. So I have ln k on the left here, and it's equal to delta s over r. Now, over a reasonable range of temperatures, it turns out that delta S's for reactions don't change. So long as you're not wildly changing the temperature for a given reaction, the delta S is going to be constant. So this term here is a constant. So it turns out that that term is our B, our y-intercept. Another thing that's going to be constant is delta H over R. Again, for a reasonably wide range of temperatures, temperatures for a given reaction, delta H over R is also going to be a constant. So I have my Y term, ln at, uh, K, excuse me. I have my B term, delta S over R. And I have my slope, delta H over R, because my X term is 1 over T. So if I were to graph the natural log of the equilibrium constant versus 1 over temperature, for a given reaction. So in other words, I do a reaction at a given temperature, I get the K value. I do the same reaction at another temperature, I get the K value. I do the same reaction at another temperature, and I get the K value. I can eventually plot all of these K values versus all of these uh, reciprocal temperature values, and we're going to get a, uh, an equation with a negative slope, a y-intercept of delta S over R, and the slope is going to be equal to delta H over R. All right, so this allows me to graphically determine enthalpy values, delta H's, enthalpy values for a given reaction. I just have to keep doing the same reaction at a whole bunch of different temperatures and keep getting their Ks, and I eventually can get really good data on the delta S value, and by figuring out where it slaps into the y-intercept, into the y-axis, I could also get the entropy change of the reaction. And this is really how uh, experimental chemists would go about getting these values. <clears throat> now let me just show you one real quick um, relationship that we can do here if, um, the, so I can uh, figure out some values algebraically. So for any temperature I'll call T1, I'm going to have a K1 value. 
And then if I do the reaction again at a temperature T2, I'd have a K2 value. So what I can do is I can take this equation here that we just sort of derived and write it for K1 and T1, write it again for K2 and T2, and take those two equations and essentially uh, subtract them from one another, and I can write down a pretty handy equation that looks like this. It's the natural log of equilibrium constant K1 divided by equilibrium constant K2 will be equal to the enthalpy change divided by R times the reciprocal differences of the two temperatures at which I obtained my two K values. Okay, looks like that. So now, using this equation on, a on the bottom, this is another good one, I'm going to box it because it's a pretty good equation. I can go ahead and let's say I know the K value for one set of temperature conditions, and I determine the K value for another set of temperature conditions. Of course, I know the universal gas constant, 8.314. I could go ahead and solve for the delta H of the reaction, or any permutation thereof. This equation here is called the Vant Hoff equation. Vant, and I think there's an apostrophe in there, Hoff. I think he was probably a German fellow. So the Vant Hoff equation that allows us to kind of bring some ideas together. What we've done here is we've brought some thermodynamic ideas together uh, with equilibrium ideas, and so we can go ahead and we can solve for things like the enthalpy of a reaction at two different temperatures that are at two different equilibrium constants. All right, so through this video, hopefully what you now have is a little bit of a better understanding of how free energy is connected to equilibrium, how the idea of spontaneous and non-spontaneous is connected to the idea of equilibrium favoring pro uh, uh, products or favoring reactants. And on this last slide, how we can combine a couple of different equations associated with free energy to be able to make some experimental considerations where I can find K values or delta H values by manipulating the temperature in my system uh, for a given reaction. All right, so that's kind of going to be our, our last content video. We're probably going to have one more that's going to be sort of a summary video, but that's about it for now.